Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. Dan, Thank you for coming back on the Silver Core Podcast. I know we've been talking about this for a while. It's unfortunate we're going to be talking about a bit of a bleak matter, but you always tend to be able to shed a little bit of ray of logic and reason on these things. So um, really, really excited to hear your opinion and hear your take on what's been going on in Canada's firearms industry. Always happy, Travis. So uh, a lot's happened. A lot's happened recently with the, the handguns, with the... Um, the freeze, I like how they call it a freeze. It's, yeah. Uh, it's very Canadian. A very, a very Canadian. Yeah. We'll just, you know, chilly up here. We'll just put a bit of a freeze on the handguns. A freeze mm-hmm. implies it could thaw at some point, but somehow I don't think that's the intention. Uh, and then, you know, Silver Core Club, we've been inundated with calls from people and emails, people saying they're getting some v- information from some very reliable sources about a... Uh, a possible stopping of transferring of firearms prior to the freeze coming into effect. And you've got some thoughts on that as well. I'm hoping these are just rumors and I'd love to hear your two bits on, on everything here. Well, I guess for, to dive right into the rumor thing, cause I think that's what people are probably the most, um, interested or curious about, uh, go back to the original groundwork. Uh, we have bill C21 and some conjoined regulations that have been tabled in proposal format. Um, What that Mm -hmm. means is there's the actual bill, which stipulates in very clear language, that when that bill passes, which means three readings in the House, three readings in the Senate, royal assent, that no individual will be issued a registration certificate for a restricted firearm, effectively meaning you cannot get another handgun. Um, Mm -hmm. The regulations attached to it are a much shorter document, and to be very clear, because a lot of confusion about regulations and OICs and people discussing this stuff. Regulations are passed by OIC. Um, They are not law. They are laws, but again, a bill and a regulation are two different things. That's why we have the Firearms Act and then we have the Firearms Act regulations. Um, Mm -hmm. Regulations are just passed by OIC, which means they're a privy council document. So it's it's literally the the little council around the prime minister's office that author these. Uh, We've seen a leaked copy of it from the parliamentary library signed off by Marco Mendicino that was tabled um, on the Monday, I believe it was. Uh, Interestingly, that that document was actually authored on May 13th. So you get an idea of the timeline Mm -hmm. here. It's probably not as extended as people thought. The regulations, the bill stipulates that you can't be issued a certificate. The regulations stipulate that they will not approve transfers. Now, there's been a lot of confusion about the coming into force these regulations. Um, I've heard the rumors. A lot of them are pertaining to the notion that the government will try and pass an emergency order of some sort. I've heard it referred to as an emergency order. I've heard it referred to as an emergency injunction. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't really understand either of those terms, but I do understand regulations and bills. I'm right. not really sure um, what they're exactly planning. They could, obviously, within government purview, they can do whatever they want with this sort of stuff. They could OIC immediately a, a transfer, and they could just call CFOs and say, just stop doing it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, they are either a federal employee or they work under a federal mandate in every case. So they do have the tools to do this. Um, as a news guy, I got to refer back to just the plain old public safety document that says fall of 2022. And to explain why that was happening, um, parliamentary tabling requirements is what the public safety document refers to as preventing these regulations from coming into place immediately. That's a reference to the standard process for regulations to pass, which means a 30-day consultation period. They table them. There's actually a website where you can actually go and comment on them. Um, 
it's it's great. Probably Travis will put a link to that there. And when the regulations mm-hmm. are posted, you'll get 30 days to comment on them usually. And then after the 30 days, they pass into law. It just kind of automatically, there's no sitting in the house. There's no readings through committees, nothing like that. Um, mm-hmm. Why it was going to be fall is because there's only 20 days left in the parliamentary calendar. So we have 20 days, Parliament would prorogue for the summer break, and then 10 days in the fall, and then those regulations would be expected to pass into law sometime in October. Um, mm-hmm. Unfortunately, most of these rumors are hinging around the notion that the government is pretty displeased with the um, pretty large increase in firearm sales to civilians throughout these last few days, um, and maybe looking to quash that pretty much immediately. I will admit, as someone who works in the industry, I don't frankly understand why so many people that work alongside me in this industry had the need to kind of poke their finger right in the government's eye and say, yeah, we're selling a ton of handguns all of a sudden. Uh, mm-hmm. It didn't seem wise. Um, it's one of those situations where, you know, if the government shows you their hand and they say, this is what we're going to do, you know, work around it. Don't. This adversarial mm. attitude is not always great. And as far as the industry goes, I think it's also a little bit unprofessional. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if you were to consult a, any kind of professional public relations firm or uh, consultant like that, they would tell you, no, don't don't go making a fight out of something that they're not trying to fight you on. Just do what you can in the meantime, strategize, et cetera. I mean, Sun Tzu would not say, yeah, just go stick your finger right in the eye right away when you don't know what the hell's going on. So I, I think for some people, it feels like a win. Hey, look at we're winning. Screw you. Poke you in the eye. Look at what we're doing. But it's maybe, the dumbest thing maybe ever. that's I'll a battle. That's not it's, the war. It's the dumbest thing. Like that attitude is just, it's so caustic for our industry. And moreover, it completely skips a very valid point, which is there There has been no increase in handguns in Canada. This this massive mm-hmm. surge in sales there for two, well, I hate to tell you this business is you bought these guns already. Like mm-hmm. these guns already existed. When I do an interview with other media outlets and they say, has there been a massive surge in gun sales? So to the, the end users, yes, in the last week, but those guns already exist in Canada and will be sold eventually anyways. This is not, mm-hmm. this is just stacking the sales in a more rapid fashion. It isn't, it doesn't represent an increase in firearms in Canada. That should have been the messaging from day one that, you know, mm-hmm. these are not guns that are being imported, et cetera. And I think that would have probably been a smarter tactic to take uh, to really highlight you know, kind of the play of the business. And I mean, moreover, we have so little time with media to make our points. Uh, why waste a single minute saying things like Justin Trudeau is the gun salesman of the year? That doesn't do anything for us. It doesn't advance our argument. It doesn't doesn't change a mind anywhere. Um, mm. Maybe it makes people think poorly of Justin Trudeau if they really hate guns, but it doesn't it doesn't do us any favors to do that kind of stuff. It's, again, just needlessly adversarial in an issue that's already hyper-partisan. Uh, we're much better off speaking to things like, you know, this is a waste of resources. Every customer that's buying a gun has literally been checked that they are not going to be a violent criminal every day. Highlight those things. Don't highlight, yeah, I'm making a ton of money right now. That just, it's it seemed like it was in pretty poor taste in a lot of cases. Yeah, pretty counterproductive. Uh, so... Uh, the rumor was 1400 Eastern time today, but from what I understand, uh, I'm looking at the watch now, that's going to be in about uh, 40 minutes. Um, mo- most likely not going to happen. Uh, but the fact that that rumor is on the table, I'm wondering where it gets its legs from. And if there is some chatter in the back end, cause I do know that the civil servants will talk in the back end about things that they would like to see happen. And they took, call it a uh, normative process. I had a, I think I, you and I talked about that one in the past mm-hmm. with a firearms officer who says, politicians, they don't make the laws. We make the laws and we do it through normative process and we'll enact our policy in a certain way so that, uh, regulation follows. Um, I, I guess if there is chatter going around, I wonder if people are feeling, if it's just straight up rumors or people are feeling somewhat comfortable in saying these things because that's sort of on possibly on the docket. No, I think this is, so for me personally, just so people know from a news perspective, my, my typical process, I I either, I need to speak to a source directly so I can validate that source's uh, efficacy myself. Um, Mm. And, you know, that's, that's done me well in the last 10 years. Uh, The other alternative is to try and find three sources. Like if I can't get someone that'll go on record, like if there's an RCMP officer says, you know, I've got this information that I'll tell you, but I can't, I can't give you my name for publication. Then I'll say, great, Mm -hmm. I need to hear from a couple other people 
that you can direct me to potentially, or I'll try and find them independently. That's the best thing you can do is find the independent sources to confirm that and say, look, look this isn't for, I'm not going to publish your name. You can be anonymous, but I need to know personally before I publish it. So that's why we, mm-hmm. we haven't reported on any of the rumors because I can't, no one's willing to substantiate this um, in any way to me. But um, on the other hand, when kind of judging the veracity of these things, I do look for specificity. That's a really good indicator I've found mm-hmm. historically. Uh, so a lot of times when, when, an, when an industry is trying to, like, for example, let's just cut straight to the chase. If this is the industry trying to push a rumor to sell a bunch of guns, they would generally be pretty vague about it. You'd hear, oh, yeah, there's probably something coming soon. And you saw that initially. There were people that were saying that, like, oh, this could happen immediately. It could happen any day. Well, governments mm. don't do things on any day. It is very planned out. It is scheduled. You name it. Um, mm. So those sorts of rumors are usually an indicator of someone's opinion being expressed as fact. But when you start to hear very specific rumors like today at 11 a.m. Eastern time, that makes me very nervous because people tend not to, when people fabricate things, they automatically default to a very vague thing because it makes it harder to get caught. No one wants to say Mm -hmm. 11 a.m. they're going to ban these things because at 11.05, you know, they're full of crap, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we'll know in now 35 minutes, but um, yep. It's it's impossible to really say for now. I'm stuck in that situation where like, yeah, I hear the rumors. I can't confirm them, but they do scare me. And I, I don't think this is just the industry. And moreover, I would point out to any consumer that like it's almost a moot point because if it happens today at 11 a.m. Eastern or it happens in October, it's happening. This is mm-hmm. we are in the fight for basically the future of handguns in Canada. You can't pass it down to your kids. You can't compete in IPSC. You can't compete in cowboy shooting anymore. From, from now on, that's that's the world we live in, and we need to confront that reality and and start wrapping our heads around, well, how, do we, how are we going to combat this? If we want to get the ability to transfer handguns back, we already need to be thinking that this is the law. Uh, you know, don't think, oh, well, in the fall, we'll start addressing this problem. And again, this right. is more relating back to that professionalism within the industry and even within our advocacy of see the bigger picture. Stop seeing trees, start seeing forests, and start acting like we're in that forest trying to find a path through it because we just keep walking into tree after tree after tree. <laughs> well, you know, there, there's always been, well, it doesn't affect me. I just, I'm a shotgun shooter. I'm a rifle shooter. This is just handguns. And the big buzz around all of this is handguns, but we're also talking about five round magazine restrictions to all five Everything. Rounds. Yep. Right. So that's, uh, you know, there, there's your lever action, your 30, 30, your cowboy action uh, person, there's your hunters. Um, this affects everybody in the sporting and firearms industry. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think that's, it's interesting. I mean, again, thinking about the, the forest for the trees argument, like that argument that it doesn't affect me is again, one of those myopic, you know, I just see a tree in front of me that says they're banning handguns and I'm not seeing what they're doing, which is, you know, a basic, I'd say probably about five years ago, uh, Liberal Party mm. firearm policy became divorced from crime prevention and became more an issue of um, political gain. To be well, not more right. of it became an issue of political gain. This law, everyone with a gun license, very has very salient ideas on the fact of whether or not this law impacts any kind of criminal activity, and it obviously doesn't sure. because I mean it's worded so as to be limited to those of us that have licenses. Um, mm. So you have to just go like again, see the forest for the trees, and go. In reality, I know they're not going after criminals, so what is their objective here? Well, they're clearly going after gun ownership, so they obviously have the opinion that gun ownership is something that they need to combat. Why do they need to combat gun ownership? Well, hmm, probably not because they hate us, this attitude that gun owners Mm -hmm. are the victims. It's not because they hate us. I don't think Justin Mm Trudeau even knows who the heck I am. He certainly doesn't know who. They don't care. We're a means to an end. No, not one way or the other. Exactly. And we are just a means to an end for these politicians for political gain. And to be very clear, it's the same thing for the conservatives. We are the means to an end for them. They see the counter argument as potentially helping them win. We need to Mm -hmm. kind of accept that, own it and make it work for us. We we can't just keep, there's no point in having debates about the, the validity or veracity of a law and its ability to impact criminal behavior when it was never created for that. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's really important to drive that home because until people kind of understand that, it, it feels like a fundamental thing that people, if you can't get your head around that, man, you're, you're not really going to get a lot of traction or or get to any kind of goals that you want to get to in this debate. Mm-hmm. So accept it and make it work for us. Yeah. Some it, people you know, would say, so what, you, you just roll over and you just let it happen and... 
No, for example, I don't I mean, think that's what you're saying. No, to be very blunt, no. Um, but I also think it's one of those, you know, you can't solve a problem without first uh, recognizing you've got one. And I think gun owners have for a long time now thought that we have the wrong problem. They think, mm-hmm. we think that in many cases we're up against the government that is trying to stop crime, that is trying to, you know, save lives, etc. Just stop. Just stop thinking that is has anything to do with it anything with their gun file it's about winning Mm -hmm. urban ridings and creating a massive wedge for the conservatives because to be very blunt this entire law it won't affect any kind of criminal's life but what it will do is the next federal election hopefully in 2023 because this government doesn't seem super stable um a, a journalist will eventually stand up and he will ask the conservative candidate of record probably pierre polyev based on membership sales are you going to give people back their handguns Are you going to give people back their AR-15s? Are you going to put assault weapons and handguns back in Canadian hands? And he's going to have to answer that question because of this law. That's what it's for. This is, this is a setup is effectively what it is. And I wouldn't be surprised to be honest if C-21 as a law just completely fades away on the writ um, Mm -hmm. and is replaced by either a toothier or a less severe version thereof based on what their internal polling shows them so that they can carry this wedge forward into the next election just like they did with Aaron O'Toole. I mean, we all remember Aaron O'Toole stammering in front of the microphone, blah, 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 I, 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 AR-15s, I don't, no, no, we, we won't let people have those. You know, they're, mm-hmm. they're setting that up again because it's a great wedge for the Conservative Party to, uh, to have to deal with. So if we don't accept that, if people don't see that as the problem and we continue to address it from this kind of moral, ethical perspective that mm-hmm. I like gun owners for you guys. I love you guys for that perspective because it's, it's what I'm like. I, you know, justice, honesty, morals, integrity, sure. save lives. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but unless you recognize that's not what we're up against, uh, it's a bit like, you know, stepping into the ring and not knowing the rules of the game. Um, mm. you know, like if you walk into an MMA fight thinking that you're boxing, it ain't going to go the way you plan, right? So we no. need to have that attitude of, okay, we see what we're dealing with. Let's deal with it. And I think, to be quite blunt, a lot of people dealing with this, they think that there are solutions to be found in the judicial system. This is not a judicial problem. It's a political problem. Mm-hmm. Um, there's been a ton of money poured into that, that an organization effort that could have been put into the previous election, and maybe we wouldn't be faced with this problem then. But recognize this is just a political problem. Get politically active. Start engaging. You don't even have to be a conservative. I mean, this is the kind of thing where, what, like 20 to 30 percent of the NDP caucus resides in rural ridings. They don't have a huge caucus right now. So their rural mm-hmm. caucus members have a pretty disproportionate level of power over that particular party. Now is the time to say, look, you, you support this, pfft, you're out. We'll make it our mission. Mm-hmm. You know, Turf Mark Holland worked. Take mm-hmm. that attitude basically to the streets and go, yeah, we're, we're going to make this a political fight and we're going to win it. Um, and I think that's what will actually happen. And I mean... Until we do, the liberals will just keep doing this because there's no mm-hmm. punishment. When you go risk versus reward, they pass a new gun law. The reward is that they get a ton of headlines because as far as I'm concerned, the media does seem to be sort of bought and paid for in this particular file, which we can talk about sure. after because there's some interesting notes about that. But mm-hmm. um, they get the rewards and there is no risk because we're not politically organized. There's no, mm-hmm. there's no like, hey, gun owners are going to take 23 seats from us if we pass this law. They don't worry about that. Because there, mm-hmm. there's been none of that. So we're trying, like I've been trying with gun vote for a few years. We finally have some data that'll be important. I think in the next election, we're trying to get it all sorted. But, you know, that takes money and, and time that as a small business, you know, I try and get subscribers and advertisers and I try and put the money out there, but I've also got a mortgage to pay. So, you know, right. we do what we can, but uh, it's going to take something like that, I think, before before we can get there. Canadians always say we want some kind of NRA. I mean, very con- controversial statement, but we definitely need to have some kind of political action that we just aren't getting mm. right now. I agree. And you know, just my personal opinion, watching what you're doing with Caliber Mag, I know you have people helping, but I know you do the bulk. You do a hell of a lot of lifting and a hell of a lot of work there. The amount of change that you're able to affect individually, just yourself, by being involved in the firearms industry and uh, setting up your own media platform is amazing. And I think think if other people can kind of take a look at what one person can do, not everyone has to be publishing a magazine. They can get up on YouTube pretty quick and easy or set up a podcast or, you know, talk to their friends. The, uh, I've got a podcast lined up with another individual. I think you and I both know him. Um, 
uh, Mr. Belofsky in uh, Ontario. One man and what he was able to do for that province. I, I think if some of that messaging can come through, because everyone looks and says, well, where's our NRA, right? What's the NFA, CSSA, uh, uh, CCFR, what are they doing for us? I'll give them some money and we're done. It's, it's not how these things are won, clearly. No, and I think uh, I don't really understand that attitude of the, you know, I'll give someone else money and that'll solve my problems because um, it hasn't mm. worked yet. Um, no. But, and I do think people do need to understand, like you have a tremendous amount of power. Like, for example, like if, if one person, if, if you just walked your MP's office, make an appointment and say like, I'm going to sit down across the table from my MP when they've got their days back in co- at their constituency office, make an appointment, make them accountable. Mm. They'll go back to their caucus meetings and they'll go, yeah, shit, you know, like, I've got angry people at my office and I don't like that, you know? Um, mm-hmm. They just don't deal with any of that though because the, the co-opting of our advocacy has gotten pretty severe at this point. Um, and unfortunately, it's also stuff like we used to have, I mean, we still do, but it's not used to the same degree, the letter writing machine that was used for a long mm-hmm. time. Um, unfortunately, Dennis Young's passing and his ability to get A tips. Uh, God, I wish I'd learned more about that, but like, you know, we've lost some tools along the way that have not been replaced uh, in terms of that individual ability to empower people. So um, I think well, gun owners did, do need to recognize they have individual power and use that. Did Dennis really have any extra powers that any ordinary citizen doesn't already have available no, to them? Other no, than tenacity? Well, you got to pay five bucks and they've actually made it a right. lot easier because public safety A-tips used to be the sort of A-tip that you had to go through a whole separate process. Now it's an online thing. You just go online, select a department mm-hmm. you want, RCMP or public safety. Those are the two that you'll always have right. for firearm stuff. You pay your five bucks, you file your thing. Um, and lots of people should. Now the problem is it does tie up the A-tip process. What Dennis had, and before anyone goes off to the A-tip website and he's just like, give me all of the gun records. Um, <laughs> why did Justin Trudeau ban guns? Um, they don't really answer responses like that positively. No, they don't. Um, they barely answer any responses positively, but Dennis, Dennis's expertise was knowing who to address them to. He had a very good idea of the organizational chart for the relevant parties. So Mm. one, one of the difficulties with getting ATIPs is just figuring out how you're supposed to get the information from, for example, I had a, I got an ATIP back. This is a very long time ago regarding the 1022 magazine debacle. Uh, to go back mm-hmm. that far. Um, mm-hmm. There was a PDF attached to an email that I received. The The file name was something about dual use magazine use, blah, blah, blah. I tried to get that. I sent that back to the RCMP and said, I'm looking for a copy of this PDF. And I had that exact file name right there because the actual PDF wasn't included in the ATF, ATIP. Mm-hmm. Their response was, we don't own that document because that document was authored by the Ontario CFO. So I had right. to then put an ATIP through the Ontario Provincial Group to get that, who then just didn't respond to me whatsoever. But that's what Dennis was good at, is he understood. Right. He could see that and go right away, okay, that's an Ontario CFO document. I need to ATIP them and he needs to pursue it. Because the other thing is you also have to be tenacious because, I mean, I've been doing this 10 years now. I have some credibility as a print media guy that's been doing this for a long time. I've been in journalism since 2003. Um I still have to send, like I can show you email chains where I have demanded documents from the RCMP five times where I say, I know this exists. And they go, no, it doesn't. I say, I know it does because I've seen the other Mm -hmm. versions of it. Give it to me. No, we we don't have that. And it literally five times going through five different ranks of RCMP communications officer before I get a tersely word email of, oh yeah, here's that file you're looking for. And it's attached. Right. And it's usually formatted. It's heavily redacted. It's usually either heavily redacted or it's given to me in the most useless format possible where it's like, oh, here's a pile of data. Enjoy the next three mm-hmm. weeks of your life sorting it. You're kind of like, cool, 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 cool. <laughs> yeah, it's we talk about an adversarial system, and as firearms owners, we definitely feel that. I mean, it's, I uh, it is an adversarial system. Our, our civil servants, who I speak with in the firearms program, there's some great people who work there. There's also some who, like we're all people. If you get people complaining to you every single day, you're going to start getting your back up. They start getting their back up. They start, um, forming opinions and those opinions will affect the disclosure of work or how fast they'll do the work or how it's, it's human nature, right? You go to an ice cream shop and treat them like garbage and you're, you're probably not going to get a big scoop of ice cream, right? 
Uh, and I think so much of this is so politicized too. There's there's serious concerns amongst the civil civil service that um, accidentally releasing information they're not supposed to, um, mm. basically releasing anything around something that is so partisan, um, and again has been dealt with, to be quite frank, so unprofessionally in many cases, mm. uh, will come back to bite them in the ass. Um, and that's not an unfair assumption for many of them to make. To be very clear, because you know, the gatekeepers at the top are are quasi political. They're not political appointments, but they're they're right next to politicians. That if something, if a if an information officer releases a file to me, and I publicize it as a normal news article, that somewhere up there, someone's going to go, "What the frig? You know, who sent mm. this out? How did that get out there? That was never supposed to be released." So they have serious concerns about that, um, and they're founded. But um, it's just, you know. We were supposed to have a government that's open by default. That's the famous phrase that Trudeau said in 2015. And yet, as far as we're concerned, and, and this is this is media wide. This isn't just gun owners. This is all media. It is it has mm. never been less transparent. I mean, holy crap, guys! Like the ATIP backlogs are two years now in some cases. Like I, I've gotten mm. documents released to me pertaining to Beowulf magazines and LAR 2022 mags, where like Bob Paulson still worked right for the cops like this is this is going back to a guy who has retired like it's mm -hmm. it's comical how slow it's all gotten um and they blame it on you know too many people asking for requests and they take forever to process because they are processing them so diligently to make sure that everything that could be problematic has been redacted uh instead mm -hmm. of just putting it out there which in this case you know like this is a great example of like an entire industry of forty five thousand people is stressing like crazy because no one knows if they can move inventory you know, individuals right. that have tons of money wrapped up in handguns that maybe wanted to sell them to someone are now going like, I don't know, I can't get anyone on the phone. The firearm center doesn't right. even answer the phone right now. We feel very, there's a term for it, feel very othered, where you've got society and culture and then there's us and we're others. Mm -hmm. uh, we aren't given the same respect. And I think there's, again, there's <laughs> reasons that we feel like that. But I mean, to go to the media stuff, because I want to get that in too, like, yeah. I attend a lot of these media briefings now. Like I did spend a lot of time away from work because I was dealing with basically a cancer scare. Um, but now I'm back at it and I go to these media briefings, especially now because they're so relevant. And like when I'm in them, the outlets that attend are not, they're not sycophantic towards the government. Like the questions they ask are not, think the, to be quite blunt on C21, most of the questions were how does this affect criminals? Um, mm -hmm. The answers did not convince anyone in the room that it did. And what concerns me a lot is that I'm seeing coverage come out that doesn't reflect what we were discussing in those briefings. You know, we have journalists from big outlets going Interesting. like, yeah. And I don't, that one concerns me more, more than most things. Cause I mean, I think gun owners are a canary in a coal mine. I've referred to us like that numerous times. I think media is a bigger canary. Cause when your media starts to collapse, you've got big problems with transparency. Mm -hmm. You know, media would normally, their self-interests would be best served by being as critical of government as they can because that's what gets eyeballs. Like when mm -hmm. Justin Trudeau stands in front of the media scrum and says it's misinformation, we have to watch out for misinformation when someone asks whether or not this gun bill actually impacts criminals. It would be mm -hmm. better for journalists and outlets in Canada to say the prime minister is lying because that headline, everyone mm -hmm. remembers the Globe headline, the story in the Globe is false. Well, you can't buy advertising like that. The Globe and Mail has probably made more money off of that headline than Lord knows what in a long time. Mm -hmm. And it, it bothers me greatly because I don't understand it. When I hear journalists from outlets say like, hey, this doesn't seem like it's going to impact criminals whatsoever. And then the, the article that comes out from that outlet is basically a press release verbatim from the government. Right. I'm not, I don't know what's going on between those two things. And I get concerned when I start to see corporations or people act in a manner that I can't attribute to their own best interests. And it's, mm -hmm. it's concerning. It's really concerning for me. And why do you think that is money lazy? <clears throat> uh, they're furthering their own political interests. I don't know. And I mean, it's, I've been thinking a lot about over the past few days, to be really honest, because it's, like I said, I work in media, um, uh, to be honest, I always think of myself as working more in media than in the gun industry because I have a media company first and foremost. We just happen right. to report on guns pretty much all the time. But mm -hmm. I have noticed that in thinking about it a lot, I'm not sure why. I know that a lot of people say, oh, it's the media bailout. Now I'll say this, like we got a grant from the government, federal government. We've been getting it sure. since Harper days. Like 
It's designed to help Canadian outlets compete against U.S. outlets because Newsflash, Guns and Ammo makes a little bit more money than we do. Um, and they're not exactly relevant to Canadians. So back in, the, I think it was 1974, the government said, hey, you know, let's try and help Canadian outlets out. Um, it's been great to us. Unfortunately, it's diminishing significantly in the next few years, but that's life. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think it's that, though, because those grants, I can tell you, they are completely, I mean, look at us. We're a gun magazine and they give us a grant. It's There are no strings attached to those. The $600 mm-hmm. million dollar tax one, there are strings attached to because you have to be an accredited news outlet we didn't just in case we didn't do that because that seems like an almost like a continuous eligibility screening that gun owners get it's sort of similar for media outlets where you kind of have to like prove to the government that you're a legit media outlet and i worry about the impact of that because that works from a publisher level down through the editorial board um so basically management on downwards and i worry about the ability of management to steer stuff like that right but i don't i'm very reticent to blame that because i don't work at those outlets and and i'm fairly certain that when someone sits down and writes a story and files it with their editor, I'm fairly certain that the journalist, the editor that reads it, and the person that posts it on the website are not being, they're not being given marching orders from management. Like that would be, media is not that well funded, and that would be an incredible amount of micromanagement that would cost right. way more than the government is even paying. So I I don't really know. My concern I guess the reasons that I've, the the two things that I can come around with is that like, it's easy, it's less risky, which these days journalists don't really want to take a big risk because if you're wrong, it'll absolutely destroy your career and your future prospects. Mm. The second thing is we've really seen, even though there's a lot of money rolling into it, we've really seen a gutting of journalism in this country. And what I mean by that is you don't see a lot of middle-aged journalists anymore. Um, You know, broke off rather those guys that we all look up to as like you know proper newsmen that gritty guys they don't really exist in a big way a lot of the journalists Mm. now are are either in their late 20s early 30s and then the second they get to a certain sort of level within media they usually will take a job as a marketing consultant um you know like if things go really sideways with the gun industry and there's no way that Caliber can make money, I'll just go and back into working in marketing and cars probably. That'll just be the easiest mm-hmm. transition because that's those are the kind of resumes that they're looking for. And we see that a lot and I worry about it because when I'm in these media conferences, I can be a bit adversarial more than most. Um, I know Brian Lilly can too, God bless him. Um, <laughs> but we're a bit of the minority and I wonder if it's just because, you know, I'm coming in on 40. I kind of have realized like they're just people too. But when you're a 28 year old journalist with maybe four years experience under your belt, you're getting close to the circles of power for the first time. You're finally getting access. The power dynamic isn't the same. Um, Mm -hmm. And if they piece out at 32 to go work for Lululemon's marketing department, um, we don't get the 35 year old journalist that comes out and goes, no, you guys are wrong. Hang on. That's not the answer to the question. Answer the question, please. Mm-hmm. You don't. You lose those people, right? So, mm. I worry. I, I sort of see that as more of the the problem with it um, than any kind of government funding stuff. That said, I do think that that tax credit thing and the, the eligibility and the the government determining who is a media outlet um, that is hugely problematic. And mm-hmm. I'm a little bit ashamed to be even tangentially attached to any kind of industry that. You know, is supposed to report on Paul. I'm of the opinion that no journalist should be friends with politicians. You can't be friends with the people that you cover. You should always be free to have that ability to be critical as needed all the time. Um, I, and I'm not seeing that now. I mean, especially when so many journalists go into working for the government. That's another problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. Well, you know, you use the term othered. And I, I've heard that before. Yes, there, there is that, that othered feeling. People say, you know, if somebody likes you, they're going to like you. If they don't like you, there's nothing you're going to say or do that's really going to change your mind. And the more that you try and protest, the more it just ingrains in them, gives them reasons to further dislike you. Um, I'm wondering, I, I, sometimes I look at the industry and I look at the, uh, firearms owners and the sporting, uh, industry after a certain point of being othered and protesting and saying, but we're fine and we're good and we're your neighbors. And it doesn't seem to be the solution here. And one observation I made, uh, recently was, uh, Ian Runkle. Ian's got a, um, uh, he's a lawyer. He's got a YouTube channel, very popular. I think he had about 
month or so ago, um, 50, 60,000 subscribers on his YouTube channel. And he yep. reports on th things that he finds interesting, which would be, uh, weapons related laws and firearms, and knives and, and, and things that, that pique his curiosity. But fast forward a month after he started talking about Johnny Depp and Amber Heard and giving a legal perspective on this and his views on videos went from anywhere from 20, 30,000, 30,000, 30,000 views on a video to like one point something million. And he's got over 200,000 subscribers now. And I'm wondering if the industry as a whole would be well served to diversify themselves just a little bit and get themselves out of that other category, because now he's got a broader platform of, uh, viewers and subscribers who just might also hear some of his, uh, content on firearms and knives. And I'm wondering if we would be better served doing that. It's hard to say, cause there's a couple factors at play. Um, one of them that has to be addressed is quite literally, and this is, I, I hate to sound like a conspiracy theorist because there are a few around in this particular industry. Um, there is the issue of social media algorithm and the deck being stacked against you. So shadow I also, banning. yeah, shadow banning. I, I also yeah. do some motorcycle safety advocacy here in BC because I'm a pretty avid motorcyclist and I was shocked. I mean, the first few times that I started putting stuff out on Facebook, um, they were, let's just put it in perspective, like nowhere near the effort that I put into caliber stuff. Cause it's my kind of volunteer stuff on the side to help bring my soul back to somewhere that I enjoy. Um, mm -hmm. but my God, the, the reach by comparison, uh, was insane. It's so much easier to reach people on social media when you're not talking about something that social media algorithms are actively trying to repress. Um, mm -hmm. I see it on caliber all the time. We've actually seen huge reductions. So many companies in the firearm space have seen huge reductions on Facebook. It is, it sure. is nightmarish trying to get gun centric mm -hmm. content out on Facebook at this point. Um, that's why we always tell people hit the share button. Cause if you don't hit share, and even if you do, like I've done the math on some of my biggest posts that have 80, 120,000 people reached, um, even there, the shares are like, Facebook is assuming a bunch of you have like 20 friends. And it's like, mm, have you ever met someone on Facebook that has 20 friends on Facebook that isn't a scammer <laughs> trying to sell you something on Marketplace? No, like mm. that's not how it works, right? So Ian definitely tapped into uh, realizing like that's a way to go. I think a lot of gun media could do that too. I think that the biggest thing that gun owners could probably do to stop being othered on a broad sense, because um, obviously with social media algorithms, that gets into specific strategy, delivery of communications and, and the methods by which you do it. From a, from a larger, or rather tactical, on a strategic level of how, what do we talk about to stop being othered? Um, first and foremost, stop saying we're the victims of these laws. Like that's the, it just, it's just not like, yes, you feel like a victim. Yes, we are technically victims because you can't buy and sell a handgun and that sucks. But like, it's talk about missing the point, you know, like mm -hmm. it's like talking about the Titanic sinking and being like, man, icebergs, right? Like they're so big. And you know, like you kind of like <laughs> people would be like, what? Like that iceberg was a real victim. You know, it was just sitting there yeah. and then this boat came along and you know, like, you know, we're kind of doing that now. It's so again, bring it. You know, the other big thing is anyone's been around and there's fewer and fewer of us uh, that have been around since the long gun registry debate bring it around to a topic people can freaking relate upon because it's like I've done the videos and I see the metrics at the same time. If you talk about, you know, how I can't sell any more handguns and that sucks, blah, blah, blah. Very few people care because it's really just 2.3 million of us that are gun owners. If you want to get down to the brass tax of it, over 75% of us with pals are over the age of 45. They represent mm -hmm. a total of 18% of social media traffic. You know, when you actually mm. break down the numbers, 2.3 million people, 75% of them are that age, only 18% of those are on social media, you don't get a big number of people. Um, mm -hmm. So first off, recognize that like gun owners are what they are and they're going to be met in person. They're going to be at gun shops. They're going to be in gun shows. They're going to be at gun clubs. You're not going to be able to access those people. Even if we just say, hey, let's get our core group of PAL holders to be more politically active. Uh, you're not going to get there by going on social media. You got to take that realistic view. If you're trying to reach out beyond gun owners and make the argument to say, hey, look, I'm a gun owner and I want you to care about my plight, uh, start by making it our plight. 
say things instead mm-hmm. of saying stuff like, hey, like I can't shoot my hands anymore. Talk about how many resources. I mean, I'll be honest. I got a 19 month old son who I've now just figured out children are just massive vectors of disease. Like <laughs> yes. lovable, but very yeah, yeah. great at getting you sick. Um, mm-hmm. Days after, and, and I've been doing interviews like this all week, talking about the resources that are going into this, watching politicians burn hundreds of thousands of dollars an hour talking about this stupid handgun ban. And then I go down and I got to spend four hours in emergency because it takes that long to get a doctor in an emergency situation. You know, mm-hmm. bring these issues home. Start saying like, yeah, you know, like they're talking about handgun bans while gas prices are going through the roof. You can't afford groceries mm-hmm. and no one can find a freaking doctor like a good old Mm. medical doctor to say nothing of the vast quantity of people who are going to need a psychologist after all this COVID stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. Make those the issues because those, that is the issue. It's not disingenuous. It's not passing the buck. It's not trying to circumvent the gun issue. It's the same issue. I keep telling people government has one tool in its toolbox and that's money. That's all it has. If a government goes bankrupt, it ceases to function. There's no law. Mm -hmm. There's no government. There's no order because it all works off money because they pass a law they got to pay a bunch of parliamentarians to meet, discuss the law, pass it. Then they got to pay a bunch of cops to enforce it. And they got to pay a bunch of judges to pass that law in courtrooms and a bunch of jailers to put people in jail if they break it. It's Mm -hmm. all money. It's the same money that they could be using to reopen Riverview. Reopen. I mean, God knows they couldn't, but Tranquil Medical Hospital over in Kamloops. Been closed for 50 years. Reopen something like that. Build. God, God, blow minds. Build a new mental health facility. It's all the same money. And I mean... I get really pissed off because I live in downtown Kelowna. To put in perspective, for those that don't know, it's a great little summer town. I highly recommend visiting. Um, But we do have a little bit of a crime problem growing here. Um, There are homeless people and addicted people. I can't walk more than two blocks from my house without coming across an encampment. And I'm starting to confront the issues of, well, when my son learns to to speak and he starts asking, well, what is that guy putting in his arm? How do you answer that question? I'd rather solve Mm -hmm. that problem. Like when Trudeau stands in front of a microphone and says, oh, Canadians are worried about getting shot. No, they're not. They're worried about, they're not worried about getting shot in a grocery store. They're worried about paying the price on the grocery store shelf. That's the reality. Mm. And as gun owners, we need to stop talking about the freaking guns because no one cares. We care, sure, but no right. one else does. And it's, it's at, I'll be frank, it's asinine to expect Canadians to care because they've gone through the same two years of COVID stuff we have. They're worried about their mortgage going up too because the interest rates. They're worried about putting gas in their truck. They're worried about the grocery prices. They're worried about trying to find a doctor for their family. You come in and you say, hey, worry about me too. They don't have the mental space for it. And we shouldn't right. expect them to. Because it's, it's unrealistic to, if you asked Canadians to care about, because at the same time, it'd be like going to gun owners and going like, you should also care about the, and to be very clear, gun owners should care about these things. You should care about the addiction crisis. You should care about the pending homelessness crisis. You should care about the lack of clean water on First Nations reserves. You should care about all these things. But if you care about these things all the time, you will crater your mental health like never sure before. Will. So we can't ask Mm. that of people. We got to just say like, hey, look, you know, like the problems you're facing are because of the fact they keep coming after people like us instead of addressing the greater issues, because those issues are hard. Trying to get their poll numbers up by banning guns is easy. Mm. And I think that's the way to get through this other thing, to get back to your big question is, is we keep othering ourselves because they keep basically setting us up to be othered. And we just don't, we just take the bait every time. It's like Charlie Brown and the football, man. Like they queue up the gun ban and we just go running straight towards it. Like, you know, yeah, gun salesman of the year. And then when the football leaves, wait, what? Like how, like that's a surprise. It's not a surprise guys. Like, come on, see the forest for the trees, pull back, take yourselves out of this, (laughs) put yourself in your neighbor's shoes. Think about what they'd say, you know? Excellent. Excellent message. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you don't think the judicial route is a route to fix this. Uh, maybe it helps. And I agree with you. I mean, I'm, I, I deal with, uh, law firms all the time and I, you and I are both dealing on a couple of, uh, matters as well, just, um, uh, for the benefit of the gun owners, should they be successful? Yep. Perhaps they're useful as a delaying tactic. Would that be about it? Even then, I don't even see that as, I mean, I don't, it, this is all my opinion as someone who is not a lawyer and who tries to avoid lawyers at all costs, uh, quite literally. <laughs> um, yeah. The problem with the judicial perspective is it could be a delay, 
But that would only assume that the judicial branch would deliver a verdict to us at the same time as it delivered to the government. What was more realistically going to happen would be that, you know, the government got word from the crown because the crown is who they're fighting in this case, that the crown would go, hey, like, it's not looking like it's going to go your way. And the government goes, okay, well, we'll just legislate. I mean, that whole key component Mm -hmm. in the law that says you can't pass this OIC because uh, they're sporting guns. You know, that's what so much of this hinges around. Well, Mm -hmm. they'll just legislate that away. Amend it out of the Firearms Mm -hmm. Act. The governor and council can determine whatever gun to be whatever they want. The end, Mm -hmm. you know, pass that with Mm -hmm. six readings, you're done. And uh, like, it's, that's where it's, it feels good. It absolutely does. And part of me does want to say we need to oppose this stuff in every way we can, including by using the judicial tools. Section 74 hearings would have been a great way because it would have, again, making our problem other people's problems. It would have made the courts tie up like crazy and the government would have been forced to confront that issue. Just like, Mm -hmm. to be honest, right now we hear from some gun clubs saying, look, we're going to bar federal uh, range rentals. So that RCMP, CBSA, corrections, that sort of people can't qualify on private ranges. Um, it's making our problem their problem. And I I do support that in a lot of ways. And I do think that the judicial method, it's an option to make our problem a bigger problem for the government. But I think the, the big issue with it is it's, it's, it's sucked all the air out of the room completely. It's seen as Mm -hmm. the, the only way forward. And unfortunately it was never a way forward. It, it was at best a delay tactic. It might've gotten our guns back for a little while. Um, Mm -hmm. but as we're all learning now, like courts move molasses slow and governments are capable of moving substantially faster. Um, Mm -hmm. so when they've got the inside track on knowledge from the crown and the ability to respond faster than we can, you know, you're, you're in an asymmetrical situation there that, you know, in any kind of conventional logic, you'd go like, don't get in that fight. Um, so I don't, it's not the way I would have gone. Um, it's why, to be totally blunt, it's why we haven't reported on it a ton because I do feel like it's just kind of whatever happens with it, the legislation will probably take precedence. Um, and mm-hmm. I do hope that as we lead up to uh, this next election, hopefully 2023, because minority governments on average last 450 days, we're 180 mm-hmm. days or so into this one already. Um, mm-hmm. And for everyone to take again context, we're 180 days into a government that on average lasts 450 and neither leader of the largest parties can attend events like Jagmeet Singh gets shouted out of an attend, an event attended entirely by Sikh people and claims it's racism. And Trudeau can't attend an event in Burnaby, I believe it was, without getting shouted down to the point where they say it's a security risk. And right. recognizing that doesn't seem like the most stable situation for governments to be going into, especially when we're going to be facing at the end of the summer prorogement, likely higher than expected interest rates, higher than expected Mm -hmm. inflation rates. Lord knows what coming out of Ukraine and Russia. I mean, they're our neighbor too, guys. Like, let's be real clear. Like, uh, there are Chinese jets that we're now learning about that are interdicting our Aurora aircraft in the Arctic airspace to distances of 20 feet. Like, we have Mm -hmm. big problems here. Um, When they come back in the fall, the problems this government faces will probably be much bigger than any of the problems they're currently facing. Um... So whether or not this government holds a whole lot longer than fall or spring is anyone's guess. I personally don't think it'll last much longer than spring of 2023. So people already got to be thinking that, like, we have this problem, like I keep saying. We we know these guns are going to get banned. The, the, the transfer is going to freeze. Mendetune has even said that the ban isn't off the table. So maybe they'll add them to the buyback and then do the buyback thing at the end of the year. Again, two-year amnesty means that even if they start the buyback at the end of the year, which they've talked about, unless they rescind that to your amnesty, uh, which I don't think they will because there'll have to be a compliance period. They can't just say like, okay, Mm -hmm. October 1st, the gun buyback starts, October 1st, the amnesty ends because like, what, they want a few hundred thousand people or now with the handguns, hundreds of thousands of people giving their guns in in one day. So there will be an amnesty period there. Um, Start thinking about that election. Start getting involved there. Like if, if you just can't bring yourself to volunteer with the conservative party, find the riding like in your riding go talk to the other people and be like, look i'm here i'll help but you got to change your stance on this issue because like it is screwed up and it's not even about me it's about the the amount of resources that you are letting this issue consume at a time when we desperately need them in other avenues like more people died today of overdoses in this country than have been mm-hmm. shot in a mass shooting in the states pretty much ever so like mm-hmm. let's just get over this whole guns of the issue thing like People that die from overdoses are people too. 
they don't want to die. It's not intentional. They're called drug poisonings for a reason. It's not an overdose. It's not intentional. They they get the mm-hmm. wrong thing. They stick it in their body and then they die. And no one, that's someone's kid, that's someone's brother. They they don't deserve to die any more than, to be quite honest, that we always refer to these, oh, the gangbangers that get shot. It's still a tragedy. We should not want these kids sure. shooting at each other with guns. Like we have to take that holistic perspective to our national health and our national safety. Um, start getting involved in that stuff now. And if you, if you do see the conservatives the way forward, then like, by God, do it. I mean, the fact that... Ipsic Canada and Ipsic BC and all these groups, like they should be like the guys that do them. Like, how are they not the chief door knockers every election? Like, yeah. how is it that like yeah, every exactly. election rolls around and the cowboy action shooters, the Ipsic shooters, the local gun clubs are like, how are they not even ho- like they, they should be hosting the conservative party candidate in the riding and, and being like, yeah, we've got 4,000 members. We'll go out and knock doors for you. We'll go out and put literature up. Mm-hmm. Like, you're starting to see this now, gun owners. I'm speaking to you guys. You're starting to see what happens when you don't. I, I have said a few times, a little bit, probably not publicly, but like gun owners are getting what they deserve. We as a country are getting what we deserve. We, too many Canadians were complacent in the last few elections. Too many Canadians did not take a hard look, even in 2015. I mean, I was one of those guys that was trying to buy a house, me and my friends in 2015, when prices started to do this in Vancouver. And I mean, even then I had friends of mine saying, oh, Trudeau's going to drive housing prices down. And I'd say, have you read the policy? It's all about rental income. He just wants cheap rents. Right. And if rents go down, the value of owning a rental property goes up. Like it's just, if mm-hmm. they're going to subsidize rent for people that can't afford it and you are a landlord, well, that's the best tenant you've got because they've got a government totally. check coming. You can't, they can't mm-hmm. skip that check. The government sends it to you. So I kept saying to guys like, look, no, it's going to drive prices up. And, and no one, no one, to be honest, no one listens. This is this is what happens when you don't. Stop being complacent. Start taking some personal agency. Read the policies on your own goddamn self. Stop listening to what other people mm-hmm. tell you about them and take action. Go to your gun club and say, hey, we, we really should be volunteering with these candidates because we need to affect change this time. Because if we don't win this election, it's over. Like, that's it. If the mm-hmm. liberals win again, in a, even a minority, as we've now seen, it won't matter. Just... This will be, if you own a handgun right now, you'll be the last person to own it. The end. When you die, it'll go mm. into a smelter. Period. Mm. There's no other answer here because one more liberal majority is that, that's it. It's over. Like they'll pass the laws and furthermore, it'll move us so far away from this being a normal Canadian pursuit that no conservative party candidate will come back to it. There's already mm. questions about whether or not a conservative party, we see it already. Jean Charest feels totally comfortable running as the leader of the conservative party while saying he will support Trudeau's ban on assault-style weapons. That's where the Conservative Mm. Party finds itself already. It's been like Mm. seven years. Imagine what a few more will do, right? It'll be over. Mm. So I'm a little bit heated now because admittedly, like, yeah, where are you guys all the time? As one of those people that has door knocked and volunteered, I can tell you, I don't see anyone showing up in an Ipsic sweater every time I go door knock. There's like me and 40 old people. Literally, mm. <laughs> that's what it is. It's me and like geriatric people who frankly, like as a young guy, I look around and go like, where are all the other young people here? Like if this lady's in a wheelchair and she's rolling door to door, where are my gun owner buddies? They're all able-bodied, mm. you know, like it's, it's insanity. So I think gun owners got to start doing that. You know, if you want to say you are the gun lobby, be the freaking gun lobby, you know, step up. Very well said. So... With the, the, the current tabling of, of C21 here, it's going to have to reach Royal Assent. You've talked about the process that it has to go through there. Um, there's a likelihood that it'll never go through, but the likelihood that it will be dropped altogether, in my opinion, is slim to none. Would I you mean, agree? I think everything that anyone needs to know about that is simply the fact like we've already seen a bill C21 and holy crap, there's another one. And like, what do you think they'll call the third one? (laughs) You know, Um, (laughs) and the last one wasn't this bad, right? The last one was, it didn't include a handgun freeze. It was uh, potentially a a provincial or municipal handgun ban. And Mm -hmm. and now it's a, a national handgun freeze. Well, you know, let's to connect the dots here, people. If you project like those old, you know, like what's the next thing in the sequence? Duh, Mm -hmm. a national handgun ban. So I expect what we'll see is, this is what I think, just offhand, this is just an opinion. There is no, Mm -hmm. I have no sources on this. This It's just kind of the, I've I've spent 10 years watching this. 
I'm not that great at prognosticating what this particular government can do. I'll, I'll admit that because I did not see this freeze coming. That again, I don't think anyone did. Um, also, too, this government does some weird stuff a lot of times that just make it really hard to predict. Um, mm -hmm. What I actually think they're going to do is the C21. We've already seen like the Friday, the Stats Canada report came out saying handgun crime is the biggest issue and all that kind of stuff. And then the weekend was dominated by the Canadian press article that went through Global, CTV, CBC, you name it. They all had the exact same verbatim article about how handguns are the problem. And then lo and behold, Monday, we get this national freeze. I expect they'll keep banging on that gun drum um, throughout the election because they see this as key to their electoral math. It's how they get to a majority by going through Toronto and Vancouver or a, minor a minority government in this case, probably. Mm -hmm. um, I think the problem is that they're going to... When the writ drops and this all dies uh, on the writ, because any for anyone that doesn't know, any legislation that has not passed when an election writ drops just dies. It doesn't pause. It just dies. It has to be reintroduced at the next sitting of parliament because the government turns over, obviously. Mm. I expect that they're going to use C C21 and the vilification of handguns and the continued sort of um, – misinformation of and displacement of you know legal gun owners for criminals and saying handguns are the problem handguns are the problem the problem for the government with handguns is a buyback of handguns would be quite expensive there's like 1.2 mm -hmm. million of them out there um mm -hmm. and they probably average about 800 to a thousand dollars a piece mm -hmm. you do the math on that it's a really big bill and that'd be really hard to justify even for the liberal government that throws money around like it's water so I think what they're probably going to try and do is use this bill to vilify us and handguns um, effectively enough so that when they run the next campaign, they are able to say, um, we're going to ban handguns, but we're not going to buy them back. That's my concern. Mm. Uh, they have mm -hmm. to get some social license. They probably have to do a little bit of marketing work between here and there to get to the point where Canadians will be okay with that. But I think uh, it's probably not entirely beyond the pale to to say that that's their goal. I mean, again, mm. the goal here is not stopping crime. We all know that. So what is the goal? Sure. Political gain, okay? How did, what's, and you go down that road and you start to go, okay, well, political gain will eventually mean that they're probably going to be demanding a handgun ban. The advocates that they listen to so closely are demanding it already. So they're mm. trying to get to that goal and they're going to go, okay, well, we need to get to the point where we can ban handguns, but we can't afford to ban handguns. How do we ban handguns without having to buy them back? Well, we make them all look really bad first. Kind of like if someone was to say like, oh, we're going to ban cigarettes. The government would never say we're, we're buying them back. People go, they're unhealthy for you and they'll give you cancer. We're not buying them back. You shouldn't have bought them in the first mm -hmm. place. That will be the exact same sort of statements they'll make about handguns. They kill people. There's no reason to own them. You never should have bought them in the first place. And I think right. when you hear those phrases, it's not that far from what we'd expect to hear, right? So sure. that's where I sort of expect them to take C21. This is the, the test balloon to see where that goes. Um, they're anchoring. Essentially. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I wish that I could have some faith in the notion that if there was enough pushback, the government would go, okay, well, hang on, whoa, this is too much, and it's not obtaining our goals anymore of either political gain or preventing crime, so they just back off. But that's where I'll say I'm not great at predicting these liberals because that's what a, a rational person would do. They don't sure. seem entirely rational all the time. I mean, Marco Mendicino himself, let's also just point this out. He's likely going to have less than 4,000 votes separating him from his next rival in his own riding. There are like 80,000 electors in that riding. When you do the math on that, it's not a huge chunk of people. And here he is gladly, happily being the face of this ban, seemingly not recognizing the flank on the political front it opens up to him. Like, I don't know what mm. kind of gun clubs are in his riding, but like... There are gun clubs here in Vancouver. You got two gun clubs in your riding. That's over 4,000 people right there. If those gun mm -hmm. clubs all go vote en masse, well, you lose your job, you know? Right. And that's what we'll be trying to do with gun vote is, is trying to get that strategic voting and understand it a bit better. But um, that's where, you know, if we can start to change the risk and reward, you know, just like you would with any kind of training anything, children, dogs, mm -hmm. you name it, risk reward, you know, and, and you just got to make sure that the politicians understand. And I think that's how we get out of this partisan loop as gun owners too. Is, is to take our own political power and keep it ourselves. Don't, don't allow it to be co-opted. For the last few years, I've definitely noticed uh, a lot of the gun organizations do not represent gun owners to the politicians. They represent politicians to the gun owners. They, they, we've seen it. I mean, the, the worst example of it was um, oh, Maxine Bernier. get some hate for this. I don't care. I mean, people can yeah. hate. Who cares? Um, Maxine Bernier is the best example of it, right? He, he was represented mm -hmm. to gun owners as the savior. 
And when that failed, we now have to deal with the fallout of that in the form of the PPC, you know, because mm -hmm. he got, he was given a massive platform for his gun policy. Um, and instead of kind of going like, you know what, start delivering and we'll start talking, you know, um, mm -hmm. politics is always a little bit of a give and take, but for a long time, I think gun owners have been giving a lot more than they've been taking, especially from the conservative mm -hmm. party. I mean, Aaron O'Toole is a great example. I mean, that guy, his campaign manager was a former lobbyist for the NFA, like, and he's the guy that turns around and says, no, I'm not going to reverse the air 15 ban. That's that kind of blew my mind, you know? So, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's great to be nice to people and we definitely should be nice to politicians that want to be nice to us. But if, you know, as everyone always talks about, it's, it's so common now in the quote unquote masculine blog world to talk about, you know, if you are not a dangerous man, you're not really, if you don't have teeth, you can't really do much. You know, you can be kind, but mm. unless you have a little bit of power and you're willing to exert it yourself, what's the point, right? Um, mm. I think gun owners kind of need to recognize that too. We got to stop being... You know, please, sir, can I have another and start right. saying, no, we've right. got 2.3 million people that have pals. We can access them. They've got significant others, kids, friends, uncles who are sympathetic to their plight. So we've got control over 7 million votes in this country, potentially. You know, don't screw with us. We just want to be left alone. And and that might be enough to start saying to the liberals, if, if Marco Mendicino had a very strong sense that running this law was going to make him lose the next election... I'm fairly certain it wouldn't look the same way it does today, you know, and, and that's the point that I'm hoping we can get to. Good point. Yeah. The whole co-opting of, of all your, uh, abrogating all the responsibility on a, a third party, like your, your gun orgs to just sit, go ahead, support the gun orgs, but stand up for yourself, do some work yourself. And can you tell me a little bit about uh, gun vote? So, oh, so the gun vote is, it's started out as a branding thing that we did for the last election. We did all those podcasts on a gun vote because this has been a very long project in the making. Um, mm. It's effectively going to be, at its most basic level, um, a strategic voting engine because we've got the ability now to uh, figure out where gun owners, we know where, we know what riding you all live in. We've got that data now officially. Um, we're working mm. with a uh, polling company to have that sorted into electoral riding associations. So we'll have an interactive map available. It'll tell us, you know, let's say uh, Nanaimo or South Okanagan is a great example because I'm not in it, but it's very close to me. Um, Richard Cannings is the NDP candidate down there. And to be very honest, he's a nice guy. He's a, he's a very nice guy and he's, and he's not a bad MP. And what I mean by that is he's responsive to his community and he raises community's interest in the House of Parliament, which is what your elected representative should do. Um, when they just pair at a party line, that's when you've got a bad MP. Um, so Richard's a nice guy. He does a good job. But he only wins by like a few hundred votes usually over the conservative candidate. And they've, the same conservative candidate, they've had that pitched battle twice now. It's been quite entertaining to watch. Um, if we have an interactive map that tells us, look, there's 600 votes that separate Richard from the next conservative candidate. And we've recognized there's 3,500 gun owners there. Well, that's, that's what we would call a target riding where the vote gap is exceeded by the number of PAL holders. So we'll start polling the PAL holders. How'd you vote last time? If we find that enough of them didn't vote, well, now we know it's an actionable target riding where we can put effort mm -hmm. into mailing those individuals, relevant stuff, reach out to those people, go to the Penticton gun show, have a booth, et cetera, reaching out to gun owners in the area to not only tell them like you can make a change, but like you can make a change. Like you need mm -hmm. to go vote because if all of you vote, this riding flips, right? So mm -hmm. that's at its core what it started out to be. Now it's, since we're starting to work with the polling company, we're recognizing there's a lot more validity and merit to it because the combination of knowing where pals exist is a great political tool obviously combined with the data that we have from our subscribers already and our ability to pull our own subscribers because the other thing is people assume that pal holders will all vote conservative they will not absolutely a lot of us are not mm. single issue voters for some people it might be you know my dad's got alzheimer's so i really need to get a better hospital in this area and blah 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 so there's understanding the complexity of all this is something that no one i don't think has really done so we're going to try and combine the data that we've got with some of our subscribers polling our subscribers to find out to get a better idea of what gun owners in canada think what they want to see what policies are important to them even on gun policy seeing what do they think? What do they stand for? You know, like, are handguns important to them? And if not, like, why not? Like, what's the understanding them better so that in the next election, we can speak to them better? Because uh, I don't think mm. anyone, we've been, 
we've often, I think we've been thought of as a, as a monolithic entity a lot and we're not like gun owners, all of us, we're, we're all complicated people, right? Like you're a business owner. I'm one, we have lots of other concerns beyond gun stuff, sure. taxes, you name it. Um, mm -hmm. So we really want to get a firm grasp on that so that we can develop a better profile of what gun owners want to see and how politicians can deliver that so that we can have more political power. Um, mm -hmm. And when it is done, which will hopefully be over the summer, um, it'll just be delivered to you guys as a tool. It'll be something like gun owners can sign up for it to receive. It'll, we don't do newsletters, as anyone that subscribes to Caliber knows. You never get an email from me, even if you want to sometimes. Uh, I think a lot guy, of people would, actually. One guy. It's a lot of work, man. Um, <laughs> we'll have some staff for it, though, especially in the election. So GunVote will be pushing content out so that if you live in a riding, it's the sort of thing where uh, you'll know. Like, if you just want to know, like, hey, I'm a gun owner and lives in sob blah blah city in saskatchewan you know well you're probably going to vote mm. cpc because they always win but let's say you're in southern ontario it'll give you a better idea of your riding your ability to influence it there will be some ridings for example where you might go like hey the conservatives can't win and the ndp can and we can tell gun owners like look it sounds antithetical but vote ndp because it's one less mm. seat for the liberals and that makes it one less that the conservatives need to take from them to get to a majority so um mm -hmm. it was used to great effect the same system was effectively used to uh, by companies called Press Progress and Lead Now, both of which were funded by the Tides Foundation, which right, if I okay. had some of those Tides dollars, baby, we'd be looking <laughs> at a different reality, but uh, uh -huh. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and they figure they flipped about something between 20 and 27 ridings uh, was wow. the responsibility of that. And we have that, like gun owners have that ability because like when you think about what had to happen for Lead Now, because like I love politics, like this is the kind of politics I love. Like I'm one of sure. those dark sider type guys in politics that doesn't happen <laughs> legitimately anymore. They had to get volunteers. So you got to go out there. You got to put a message out there that inspired a bunch of young people to put on shirts that said press progress. And they'd knock on a door and go, you shouldn't vote for Stephen Harper. And here's why, you know, mm -hmm. I lived in a riding where that happened and it happened like six times. These groups of like two or three young people would come up and be like anyone but conservative. Here's why. Like we don't even have to go looking that hard. I can just call a gun mm -hmm. club. Like, Hey, Nanaimo fishing game club. Uh, do you mind if I come out there for a weekend and chat with you guys and, and maybe we can get some emails out to your members? It's really, really, really important. Like this will change mm -hmm. the future of handgun ownership in Canada. Let's get you guys out there. And I bet you I can get enough guys knocking on doors in areas like that by going through gun clubs because we're our handgun owners. We know where they are. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a repository of those people available to us. And as a community, it shouldn't be hard to get to them and it shouldn't be hard to engage them and get them enthused about this. So that's what gun vote is going to be doing entirely just literally that so um building can, it up how can people support that uh, right now just subscribe to caliber because we don't take donations um i've got a few meetings with people to try and get kind of a funding seed started for it just to get it off the ground in a big way and once the website's up and running we are hoping to take like a patreon type model because i'm i'm pretty reticent to take donations it's just kind of uh, we probably will have to at some point but i'll hate it because i'm just not it feels a little you. bit too much. Yeah. I mean, I don't have to really talk about it too much. There's nothing wrong with donations. I, I know exactly like, where you're going. It's yeah. just not like me. Like it's not, I got to, yeah. you know, at some level, you just got to kind of recognize your own role in this. And it's not, I'm not that guy. So mm -hmm. we'll probably do some Patreon stuff and use it as content linked. So like you can use Patreon to support the content being created really directly. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that'll be how GunVote is probably fun. We're also doing the same thing for Caliber. We're trying to get Caliber over to a Patreon type model. Because a lot of guys like that month by month sort of thing. And a lot of people do want to support the stuff we're doing. Because while gun vote is kind of the the political entity looking to create change, you know, we've really made a real concerted effort to shift caliber towards kind of like the, you know, scribe of the community. Like we're, we're trying to take down histories now. Like we got this great writer named Richard. He just came out of the woodwork. Like talk about a godsend though. He's in Ontario. And he's got all the right contacts to take down the history of like that big article we did on Long Branch. He's moving on to small arms right. limited in the next one. And like I'm working, we're working towards this big article on Dimaco because of course Dimaco doesn't exist now. Now it's ancient history. Mm -hmm. It was Dimaco, which has been gone for years. And then it was cold Canada, which has been gone for years. So mm -hmm. taking down these histories of like, like there's a guy that sold a bunch of guns to the SAS and started Dimaco on that special operations kind of angle that we all know and love them for. And then he got fired because he wasn't supposed to sell any more guns. Like, this is the kind of history that, you know, <laughs> like, there's some history, like, one thing in the Long Branch factory, that, that no one writes this stuff down, and if we don't, who will? There was a massive problem of chlamydia. 
because it was a factory full of women that, <laughs> and people got needs, man. Like wars sure. going on, like stuff goes around, you know? And then when the factory actually got going, our next article, we're talking about how it actually got the nickname The Butcher Shop because they were producing so many guns. They were putting so many people through pretty rapid training to get these guns out. And I mean, guns are, even today, they're a big ass machine shop that makes these things usually and machine shops are not inherently safe places. So you can imagine like with rudimentary training coming off the street with almost no experience with machines like that there was a metric ton of injuries and it got the nickname mm. the butcher shop because it was so brutal and they had to they had to address these things like these were these are real issues that like i'll be blunt better politicians that we've seen in a long freaking time had to address on mm. the while they were hitting the road running they had to fix these problems um and i'm very cognizant of the fact that like we are now the, the longest running gun magazine in Canadian history. And I view it like I take it and it sounds super cliche, but it's just a game like the way I might love history. If I don't write this stuff down, no one will like the history of para, like everyone, everyone that works in the industry has a pretty well known understanding. Like para got into some problems because a lot of guns went missing pretty regularly, like right off the factory floor, they'd go into a lunchbox and poof, they'd start churn, turning up in organized crime circles. And, there was a lot of like problems with para that way. But like, I've also met the guy, he was not associated with any of this, who he literally invented the double stack 1911 meg for para. That's his really? patent. You know, like he's a guy, yeah. he lives in Ontario. He's super, super nice. That's a story right there. Like, and that's the kind of thing where like, if you want to support what we're doing, just go get a subscription because it's the only way that we can take your money effectively. <laughs> um, so just go to the website, buy a subscription and it will send you the magazines. Um, because that's what we're doing and, and whatever we make extra that we can spare goes over towards gun vote to help pay for, for hopefully creating the change in the future. So I'm going to have links to that up in the, uh, in the podcast notes and on the YouTube notes here. Uh, definitely support the magazine. Definitely, uh, gun vote. I think you should be putting it onto a Patreon sooner as opposed to later. I get the, I get yeah. the concept. I get the. Maybe we'll do like a Kickstarter or something. I gotta, I gotta look into the crowd. I've never been into the crowdfunding stuff, so I'm, I'm a bit of a fish out of water on that front, but we'll probably look at getting that up and running really soon. Cause it's because I'm working with an existing polling company that everyone knows very, very well when it finally comes out, it, it's not difficult. It's just the bill to pay, you know, and it's, it's mm -hmm. not like, it's not like they need more and more money. It's just, okay, it's going to be about 80 to $150,000, depending on what level we want to go to with the website integration and largely the integrated mapping stuff. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's just kind of a finite amount. And if we can reach that threshold, then it'll be a very good tool, hopefully in perpetuity, because now... Like I said, this is that was that that's literally the report that I had to go back and forth the RCMP five times. Be like, I know you make this report, and they kept saying, No, we don't. And I was like, I know you freaking do. Like, mm -hmm. send it to me. So now that we've got <laughs> it, it's it's really easy to keep this as a living document moving forward. And also, too, the more that we pull with the combination of our subscriber data and and gun owners at large, we will always be working towards a more refined image of who gun owners are. That perspective will get better and better and clearer and clearer until eventually we have a very good grasp of who gun owners are and what they want to see, but also to what what do other people want to see? Because I mean, part of this whole thing that I've been trying to work on is like, I have a gun license, my wife has a gun license. We have lots of friends that don't and they're becoming more and more sympathetic to our plight. So like how many, how many people do you think in your social circle are now sympathetic to gun owners. That'll always be a changing metric, but we should always have a firm grasp on it because that's where we can embrace a little bit of this power and stop having to rely on, you know, co-opting power from a political party or working with politicians on deals that unfortunately are not always guaranteed, right? Right. Especially if you don't have the, if you have no power in the political sphere, you have nothing. Mm hmm I agree. Is there anything else you should be chatting about before we wrap things up? No, I'm still hearing that apparently there's no motion. The federal government did not present their motion today. The next meeting is June 7th. Uh, the Canadian okay. Sporting Arms and Ammunition Association is saying that they believe the next opportunity the government has to introduce the transfer freeze. Um, I don't, I'm not really sure what they're basing that on, but if you can still get a transfer done, um, do it now because that way you can still at least shoot the damn things between now and the next election. And like I said, just reiterating that, like take some agency of your own damn self, get your gun clubs, mm -hmm. your friends, do what makes sense. Don't just say like, hey, look, guys, like this is how we're going to solve this political problem we've got. 
We need to help mm. a local candidate. We need to unseat a liberal. We need to go and put ourselves in front of a liberal. If you've got a liberal MP, don't be afraid of them. They, they can't do anything to you. They're your MP. They work for you. They are your elected representative, and they should be reminded of that. They do not represent the government to you. They represent you to the government. So put yourself in mm -hmm. front of them. They'll be in your riding all summer. They'll be hobnobbing Canada Day. I can guarantee most of them are going to have a table at the local Canada Day parade. Get out there. Be like, hey, look, don't be an asshole. Don't be like, hey, what's your fucking problem with me? Because that will go exactly nowhere. Oh, I got that far without swearing. Almost. Yeah. You <laughs> um, almost did it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've been really working on that too. My yeah. wife told me to swear less and I've been, I've been trying, but it's, whew, it's tough. Colorful language. As okay. I keep saying, I like colorful language. I don't know why people want to talk in black and white, but I agree. go put yourself in front of the MP. Uh, if it's an NDP or a liberal, put yourself in front of them and say, look, like I'm, I, I'll have you know that I understand you're just wasting a colossal form of resources and I'm going to make it my mission to ensure that everyone here knows that unless you change your tune. And I'm happy to work mm. with you to change you and educate you. I could take you to a gun club. I can show you the rules. Like, did you know that everyone that has a gun license has a daily criminal record check? And if we commit a violent crime, we lose our guns the next day. So when, mm. when people ask, is this affecting violent crime? You can tell them it absolutely is not. It can't by law. That's the way it's worded, you know, and, and get out there because it's, if we don't do that, then what's the point? Like, if you can't even stand in front of a liberal MP that's representing you to the government and say, hey, what the heck, dude? You know, we should probably all just fold up and go home. Because, I mean, mm. this is just basic civilian duty. This is you doing your civic duty as a voter to, you know, it's not, it's not just dropping a ballot in a box every four years, guys. This is, this is being a, a, a citizen, truly, you know. Um, and thank you know it's not Starship Troopers you don't have to go to war to do that so you can just walk right up to them it's not that hard so I would I would definitely say that that's try and get a subscription sure that's great but uh, yeah no that's actually really important too but also important is the definitely go and put yourself in front of your elected representative and make sure that your opinion and the opinion of all of us gun owners is being adequately communicated to them I like it get, get your subscription Support your gun stores, your gun organizations, your ranges, your clubs. I mean, Silver Core Club, we've, we haven't gotten so many emails and phone calls and, uh, in, in the last couple of days, messages through social media. Um, and, yeah, cause and clubs will die too. Reason. Like just in case everyone doesn't understand, like if, if this passes, like I've been a club president for two years past the allowable term limit at my local club. I'm not it anymore. So you can't get me society's act. <laughs> um, but <laughs> Clubs are run on restricted ownership, man. Like you got to have a club membership to get a handgun. Not legally. I get it. You technical people. Technically, actually, I don't want to hear it. Most of us just sure. get a gun club because sure. the easiest way to go about it. Yep. Those clubs will all die. Like if you like shooting at a gun club, you better enjoy it while it lasts unless you start stepping up because there ain't no way these clubs exist 10 years down the road if there isn't any more handgun ownership. They, mm -hmm. It's what people belong to clubs for primarily, you know, and, and that includes clubs that have very vibrant other sections like here in Kelowna we have a club of 350 people 20 okay. of them are historical reenactors that shoot black powder that's their thing mm. well guess what if our club closes down because handguns go well the black powder has gone too so we lose that whole group of guys that can tell you how Hudson Bay fur traders stitch together their tents and they do this every year for high school students and boy scouts we lose mm. that as a very real part of our actual community like you know, the Boy Scouts should care that this handgun ban is going to affect them because it means they lose that. They won't get their leatherworking badge next year. Like it's, it's important to show people that this isn't just the fact that handguns are being frozen and, oh, you can't buy that 1911 you want. In fact, it is not about that at all. It is about the fact that your neighbor can't get a doctor. You know, it's, it's, it's everything. And it's right. Get into that sort of mindset, guys. It's not it is not just handguns. If you like to zero your rifle once a year at your local range because it's got a fixed distance, probably should care because mm -hmm. you won't be able to do that now. Like it's it's that important. And that stretches as far as all of the businesses too. I mean, Caliber is a magazine. We have the ability to sell ads to realtors and car companies and diversify our income. And we're trying to do that now to be very clear. The reason I keep asking for subscriptions so much lately is quite literally because I'm trying to reduce the amount of financial strain we put on the industry because we've been advertiser funded mm -hmm. for years. And mm -hmm. with what's going on, I don't want to go to the industry guys and say like, look guys, we got to increase our rates. Paper rates have gone up a ton. We've been eating those costs because I really, 
I'm aware of the fact that like I'm a cost center for a lot of these companies. And I do not want to burden them. It's much easier to say, hey guys, 30 bucks for a subscription. Like it's 30 bucks gets you like an eighth of a tank of gas nowadays. You don't even bat an eye spending it at the grocery store. You send it up to me, it makes a big deal in my life and it reduces the strain on the industry. These are the sorts of things that will all die. Our entire culture will just cease to exist as gun owners mm -hmm. and as a student of history, that'd be tragic to me because I already look at old gun magazines from the turn of the century even, um, which I'm hoping to republish soon so the guys can see them because they're pretty crazy. Um, yeah, like 1920s magazines from like the Canadian oh, days. Oh, I love those. They're awesome. Um, yeah. I've got the full, I, I wish I, they're on my shelf over there, but the stack is like this big. Um, we've already lost that. Like I can flip through that and, and everyone will see all these articles and go like, wow, I wish we still had these fine gun makers and these historians that we've lost. Well, whatever mm. we've got now is what's going to be lost next. So get off your ass, basically. Um, yeah. Start working. Okay. Daniel, thank you so much. I really, I always really enjoy our chats. Me too. It's, uh, it's enlightening. It's a lot of fun. You're, uh, you're a, a ray of light in an otherwise bleak world here of, uh, <laughs> you provide a perspective that, that, uh, I find is, uh, really helpful. Thank, Thank you, you for being on the Silver Pro Podcast. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure.